So glad to see you here today. And you might say, who are you? Why are you up there? It's because Pastor Mark and Kim and Esther are gone. And they are gone to a competition down in Dayton, Ohio. So be praying for them as they come back late, late tonight. So in their absence, I'll leave the singing this morning. Hang on, babe. And we will continue on like normal. By the way, teenagers will be in here today. Okay? If you didn't know that, teenagers will be in here. All right? Let's turn to number 461. <clears throat> Don't we start with a song? Yes. Yeah, we do. Okay. I just had a middle, middle block. Let's stand and sing Stepping in the Light. is who doing uh, oh you, uh, uh, Esther they, she plays in a band a special band from Kent City and they're in that kind of competition thank, thank you for asking hey you know what I need some help up here with the offering who has a dime? I saw your hand and your hand first come on up and we'll take the offering and then after that um, we'll see who might have had a birthday all right Lord thank you that we could be here today. Thank you for these children that are able to come. Lord, uh, we know that several are gone. We pray for Pastor Mark and Kim and Esther as they travel late tonight. Uh, give them a blessed time. I pray, Father, for the word of God this morning to be preached, for the Sunday school uh, that the word of God will be ta taught as well. Bless each Sunday school teacher. Bless this offering in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
this. I want to make sure that one of them that's not in the bulletin is this Saturday is a progressive dinner for the teens. And Pastor Mark sent me a note. He said, we could use some host. We could use some help. And he said, if you could be willing, then call Kim. So, um, that, of course, not today because of their travels, but uh, call her if you would like to be uh, participate in that. That's this Saturday at 4 o'clock. And um, uh, let me double check the bulletin a minute. Forgot to read something very, very important. Here it is. Thank you for all your prayers and flowers and thoughtful kindness you sent our way in Steve's home going. You are dear to our hearts. We covet your prayers. In memory of Steve, love, Lorene. And we're glad to have Lorene with us again. You don't know when you're going to be moving yet, do you? So you might be here for a while longer. Let's see, today is the uh, 23rd, isn't it? 20, what is it, 23rd? And uh, closing, that means you might be gone next week or the week after. Well, we're praying for you. And uh, Lorene was just sharing with me this morning what it's like to pack up a house. How long have you lived in that, in that address? How many? That is, that is a difficult process, isn't it? We're going to be praying for you. We're sure going to miss you. We sure are. Be sure to look at your bulletin. They're available back there. And I'll mention the other announcements uh, a little later on. And uh, who's had a birthday? Anybody? Whoa, yeah, come on up. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Only one will not do. Born again means salvation. How many have you? So, when's your birthday? birthday bar and you're probably what 39 yeah i wish 67 67 oh wonderful you're the same birth same month as my wife yeah happy birthday let's give her a hand thank you Amen. anyone uh, how about uh anniversaries april's a good month to get married is anybody uh in that category this morning nope all right we're going to stand and sing before we go to our classes this little light of mine. Does anybody want to come up and help me? I'm in need of help. Come on up. I'm in need of help. I'm like, I'm like a, I'm like a poor excuse of a song leader. I need help. Yeah, awesome. Now we gotta use our light. All right. Let's sing. This little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine. I'm gonna let. It
we left off in John 8. We'll, uh, we'll go back there in a minute. Let me find my prayer requests. Here they are. <clears throat> it's good to see Walt here this morning. I have him down on, on the prayer list. I wasn't expecting him to be here, but he's here. And uh, he's probably got about, what do they call it, cabin fever, about raring to go because he's not been able to do much. And uh, so we're, we're thankful that he's doing as good as he's doing. Well, if you didn't hear, I, I tried to get it out there yesterday morning, but uh, Friday night, Hannah had little um, Luke Willard Joseph, eight pounds, 14 ounces. So that's an answer to prayer. And I heard that Stephanie Marks had her baby. I didn't catch what she had, but praise God, a boy. Praise the Lord for that answer to prayer as well. And so those are some praises about uh, additions. Amen. Um, I want you to keep praying for uh, Patty Sobchak. Uh, you know, Patty and Joe have been coming to our church about a year. Joe got saved back in um, uh, November. We're thankful for that. But she has sepsis and pneumonia. And I've been in contact with him about her condition. Uh, she's laying low. She's at home. Um, just taking it easy, doing what she's supposed to be doing. He's keeping an eye on her, but that's very serious. So pray for, for Patty. Uh, of course, that's Audra's mom and dad, um, Audra and Sam, our neighbors. Um, <clears throat> mentioned Walt. Let's keep praying for him. Howie and Dorothy. I put out a special prayer request the other day because Dorothy's going through so much with Howie's situation. I, I got a good visit with Howie. Um, I think it was Friday, uh, Thursday, and um, yeah, it was Thursday. He was in good spirits, and he was eating, which was a good, good sign. He's at Valley View on Four Mile. I also had a good visit that day with um, Donna Ridgeway. Um, keep praying for her. She's going to be moved to an assisted living place in Cedar this coming Friday, so pray for uh, Donna. Also, um, how, how, uh, Dorothy's daughter, Rachel. Rachel Brockway had some cancerous uh, uh, lumps removed this week. And so we're praying for her. Pray that they got all of that cancer. Uh, so keep her in your prayers. I mentioned Pastor Mark and Kim and their traveling mercies. Don't forget to pray for Pastor Richard Gates down in Florida. Our building project. Oh, it's so frustrating. I've been waiting to hear from them about the forms I've got to fill out. Now I've got to go over through that again and say, where are these forms? I went a week and a half ago in person, you know, so I don't know what, what the holdup is there. I, I don't think they're going to be a whole lot of help, but we just have to keep trying, okay? We're not going to give up. So pray for that. I've been talking to uh, Corey about the, uh, the septic system. Uh, it's going to happen when it's going to happen. He's got to finish another job before they can come here. So that's all in the process. Do you have any prayer requests this morning that you'd like to mention? <clears throat> Don't forget that tonight we have a deacon's meeting. Um, also, Tuesday night is our a quarterly business meeting at 7 o'clock. Don't forget that. Hopefully, we can have enough people to have a um, quorum. I, I have faith that we will. So, praise the Lord for that possibility. I'm going to write down unspoken. How many of you have an unspoken this morning? All right. <clears throat> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for answers to prayer like uh, Hannah's delivery of little Luke and um, Stephanie having her little boy sometime recently as well. Thank you for these answers. We pray for these children. Uh, Lord, uh, bless them with uh, go growth and uh, health and we pray for their salvation at an early age, Lord. I pray, Lord, for Patty and what she's going through, please strengthen her body and uh, touch her and heal her. I pray, Father, for Walt. Thank you that he could be here today. Please help him. Father, I pray for Howie and Dorothy. You know what they're going through. And uh, I know Dorothy's possibly going home this weekend from her daughters. I pray for her other daughter, Rachel, as she's dealing with the aftermath of this, uh, this two lumpectomies. Give her a complete recovery, Lord, and, and I pray that you would cause her, her cancer to be totally gone. Please um, protect Pastor Mark and Kim and Esther as they're on the road. They're driving for the school today, tonight. They won't be getting back till very late. Give them safety, Lord. 
Lord Donna Ridgeway, uh, such a sweetheart, sweet lady. She's discouraged. I pray that you would encourage her through the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray for Pastor Richard Gates down there in Florida. Keep him and, and uh, Lord, help him to remember that you're always with him. I pray for the building project in all phases. Help that, Lord, to get going. And I pray for these unspoken that are raised. Bless now our study in the word. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we went through most of eight last time, but we're going to back up just a little bit because I want to remind you of the, um, the, vir the virulent hatred these men had for our Lord. And that doesn't surprise us. When you, you see people today, um, nowadays you come across somebody, you can just tell they have not only a hatred for the things of God, but they hate you because you identify with the things of God. Jesus said, marvel not if the world hate you, because it hated him first, but we should not marvel. It shouldn't surprise us if we're hated by the world. And you don't have to do anything. That's kind of that phrase, <clears throat> hated without a cause. That's the case. You don't have to do anything. Uh, just being who you are is enough to uh, elicit their hatred. And that's sad. But, you know, the Lord, he, he put up with a dishonor. I'm going to back up to 31. We, we read through it, but I want to repeat that section. I think it's important. Because we see the source of their, I'm in John 8, verse 31. This said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. If you continue in my word, then ye are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The wonderful freedom from many aspects. Salvation makes us free from the power of sin. Now, it doesn't make us free yet from the presence of sin. Um, we're, we're free from the penalty of sin, by the way. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. By the way, think, something to think about, because we don't believe in limited atonement. The, there's a verse where Peter's talking about those people that um, they are false teachers. It says, even denying the Lord that bought them. So even the lost and the false teachers and the apostates, Jesus bought them. But that's part of the, the whole, you know, record against them is their sins were covered at the cross, but it don't count because they don't put their faith in Christ. And so it says, even denying the Lord that bought them. <coughs> Excuse my throat this morning. <coughs> but we are not only saved from the penalty of sin, Christians, we're saved from the power of sin. Now, we still have a sin nature. Uh, sin is powerful, it's deceptive. If you allow it, sin only gets a grip in your life in what you allow because you now have the Holy Spirit and greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. If you will submit to the Holy Spirit, you can have victory in many areas of your life. But I'm looking forward to the day when we will be saved from the very presence of sin. Isn't that exciting? <clears throat> that happens after our deaths or after the rapture. And at that moment, at the rapture, we're changed. And this body is changed and fashioned like his glorious body. And we will not ever have another thought that's sinful or ever commit another sin again at that point. We don't believe or teach a eradication of the sin nature. There might be some groups that teach that. Some people that claim, I haven't say, sinned in 10 years. or Those are fault. Read 1 John. Uh, 1.8, where if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And 1.9 is for us all. But anyway, I look forward to that fact that we're going to be saved from the very, we are saved, but from the very presence of sin. But we're free indeed. He shall make you free. They answered, we be Abraham's seed and we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Wrong. They forgot about Egypt, where the very place that Israel was birthed out of Egypt. Hosea 11.1, 1, out of Egypt have I called my son. Uh, the very place is the birthing of the nation in slavery and bondage. And uh, God gave them a great, mighty deliverance. But they somehow forgot that. They're thinking and hearkening back to Abraham and forgetting about the times two or three hundred, four hundred years later. <clears throat> well... 
Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. <clears throat> Let me just say something that, a transition that happens here. It's a great one. Before we were saved, we were the servants of Satan. We were the children of the devil. After we got saved, guess what happened? An adoption took place. An adoption into the family of God. We're no longer servants like a slave is a servant and isn't part of the will. A slave might uh, be told, go here, do this. And when he dies or the master dies, that servant may not get anything. But a son is an heir. And we are joint heirs with Christ. So he says, you shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. Now notice they start getting really hateful here, really mean. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, if ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they unto him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. So they are accusing Christ of being an illegitimate child. Because they listen to the rumors. They listen to the lies. They don't know that he's not actually from Nazareth. He's from Bethlehem. They don't know that he's not actually a, child, a son of Joseph. Uh, he is the son of God. He had a virgin birth. And uh, they don't know a lot of that. And then it says, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. Now listen to this. This is a very important verse, 44. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do, he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. Two main sins right there. Murder and lying that Satan authored. And of course he was the one that committed the original sin of pride and so forth. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? They could not point to any sin that Jesus had ever done because he was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners and higher than the heavens. He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not because ye are not of God. <clears throat> Interesting, he's speaking to spiritual leaders. He's speaking to people that are thought highly of, thought of as the spiritual leaders in the community. And he said, ye are not of God. Then answered the Jews and said to them, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? Two, two points of slander. A Samaritan was a hated person. They were considered half-breeds uh, in, in, in the eyes of the Jews because they had intermingled back in the days of uh, uh, the attack by the Assyrians when they took many of them away and took the tribes away. But there were people left behind. And um, they... In their eyes, were they were corrupt. And uh, the Jews, of course, had self-righteousness and uh, self-exaltation, put the Samaritans down. You can read more about it between Jesus' talk with the woman at the well because she was a Samaritan. And notice, and he says, and hast a devil. Now they're, getting, they're blaspheming. Now they're approaching unto the unpardonable sin when you attribute to Satan the works of God or the works of the Holy Spirit. He says, Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and ye do dishonor me. And I seek my, not mine own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. <clears throat> then said the Jews unto him, now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and thou sayest, 
If a man keep my saying, he shall never see the taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, who, which is dead? And the prophets are dead. Who makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Very profound statement. Then said the Jews, and if thou art not yet 50 years old, and thou hast seen Abraham, Jesus saith unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Now he's claiming to be the great I am. And he is. Jesus is the one that spoke to Moses out of the burning bush. I am that I am. We'll hear in the message this morning more about his creative powers and who he is. But he says, then they took, then the Bible says, then they took up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them and so passed by. It wasn't his time. They're going to get him. We know that. But it's not until God lays down, no man taketh my life from me, he said. But what a powerful statement. Before Abraham was, I am. A couple of things that we should think about here. One is the fact that Jesus made this statement about shall never see death, verse number 51. He shall never see death. Um, how do you, how do you, Jive that with like, you know, Lazarus dies and a couple of chapters are going to deal with that. Um, we know these men in the Old Testament died. How, how would you explain it? If, if, pardon? Eternal death. That's right. They're not going to ever see eternal death. It's just, death is just a change of venue. For you young people, when we say something like that, what we mean is, the spirit of man never dies. Mankind. We are going to be forever in one of two places. Either forever in the eternal glory of heaven or in the lake of fire. No in between. And so when Jesus says he shall never uh, see death, it just means it's a change. Your existence here, you, you perceive things, you look around, you can, you can feel the, the, uh, the, the senses, you can smell, see, hear, touch, but you're going to have a heightened sense in a perfect existence in the presence of God. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Just to take verse 51 and apply it to something he says later when we get to it is chapter 11, verse 25. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? So the definition of die has to be looked at in a, in a different way. Uh, people die. Adam, Abram died. Uh, you know, Noah lived like, I don't know how many years, three or four hundred years after the flood. Shem lived like five hundred years after the flood. But they died. But they're in glory. They're, in, they're with the Lord. And so... And God, in talking to the Sadducees who didn't believe in angels and didn't believe in the supernatural and didn't believe in the resurrection, he said, he's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. Talking about the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He's the God of the living. That's what gives us hope. We know, I know my, my two dads are in heaven. My real dad, my stepdad, I believe they're in glory. They're saved. My mom is up there, my grandmother. My little grandson, Jacob, and other grandchildren that we that didn't know, never saw, they died in the womb. Uh, I believe I have a, uh, two siblings up there, Caroline, and I have a, a sibling. I, my mom told me that she lost a baby before I was born. I believe they are there, and I'm going to see them someday. How about yourself? You know, you know somebody's there that you love dearly. But when he says, shall never see death, uh, I think Tom hit it, the death of eternal separation, the death that's returned in the book of Revelation. It's called 
the second death. The second death. Um, blessed and holy is he that hath part of the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. That's what you want to be is part of the first resurrection. That's what you want to have. Two births and you only have one death or none. If you only have one birth, meaning not born again, you will have two deaths. Very, very serious. Wow, I feel like I've already taught the whole lesson. It's only 10 o'clock. Is that clock right, Victor? Okay, good. Anybody have a comment before we um, go further into chapter 9? Does this bring up something else you want to mention or talk about? Boy, these people were really hateful, weren't they? Have you ever, you ever felt that the, the glare of hate from somebody? You didn't, you didn't even know them. Maybe you knew nothing about them, but because they knew who you are or who you represent, they just can't stand you. I'll never forget going to uh, Jamaica. And Brother Brown took us back, and I was scared to death. He was riding on the wrong side of the road, for one thing. And uh, uh, we're driving back to get to his place, and it's up in the mountains. And he had to stop at this place and go in to uh, talk to someone. And us men, the four of us, were sitting in the van. And there was a guy standing there. He, almost, he looked like a gang member, tattooed all over. And he was looking at me. And I, I averted my eyes because I didn't, I, you know, to look at it would, would have been a challenge. But he was looking at me like, oh, man, if I could get a hold of you, I would tear you apart. That was the, that was the jive. I was, you know, the vibe I was getting. And, uh, you know, that's something to see people like that. Why? They're, they have no cause. Jesus said it. He said, you're going to be hated. They took up stones to cast at him. They couldn't stand that he claimed. To be the great I am. Well, let's go on to chapter 9. And Jesus passed by. As Jesus passed by, you know, he just got away from these people that were going to throw stones at him. And he goes just enough out of their reach that he sees a man. And he saw a man which was blind from his birth. Think about that for just a minute. This guy never saw his mom and dad. He'd never seen a beautiful sunrise or a beautiful sunset. Never seen the colors of the rainbow. Imagine what it's like to be born blind. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? We have assumptions, don't we? If something bad is happening to somebody, we assume it's some kind of payback. We assume the worst. That's one of the dangers a lot of times. Christians are guilty of it too. Um, making, prejudging based on, you know, somebody might be crippled, they might be blind. It doesn't mean that they are, you know, directly because of sin. We know that all lameness, blindness, sickness is the result of sin. We know that. But their question, they're, they're asking, did, did this man sin or did his parents sin? I love Jesus answered. Jesus answered, neither have this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest. Now what he means is this blindness is not because of his sin or not because of his parents' sin, but it's because I'm going to do a mighty work here. And so it has to do with God making manifest of his work. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam which is, by interpretation, sent. And he went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. Now, I've been watching a really neat Christian man, a Jew that is a believer online. It's called Israel, my channel. And he walks you all through the old city. He'll go, I mean, he's been all over it. Now, I feel like I've been back to Israel. The, to the tours that this guy takes, it's really amazing. Well, his most recent was, 
um, in the city of David. And, of course, the, the traditional, without going into too much, they had it all wrong. The historians and the people had it all wrong. They, they called the city of David the western side, and it's totally wrong. He found, according to uh, the spring, Gihon, and the water that flows there, and the, um, the way that Hezekiah turned that, built a tunnel so that water... Well, that ended up coming down to this place called the Pool of Siloam. And right now it's a dry, um, you might call it an excavation site because they've discovered it and they're working on it. But uh, you can see how it lays in relation to the old city. And it's, it's part of the city of David. The city of David is a region south of the walls of the Temple Mount. And it's very, very interesting. So I was just watching this thing about the Pool uh, here called Siloam. So Jesus probably found this man up by the temple where he had been in this, uh, you know, verbal battle with these uh, Pharisees and Jews. And then he sees this man and he spits on clay and puts it in his eyes. That's interesting. Uh, you know, the Lord could have done it any way he wanted. You know, he could have just said, be, be, be seeing but he does this for whatever reason. Uh, maybe it's to test this man's, you know, desire to really see or not. But he went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him that was blind said, Is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. But and he said, I am he. <laughs> You know, some people, hey, he looks like him. Uh, I don't think so. Yeah, it's me. I'm the one. I was blind, now I see. Therefore said they unto him, how were thine eyes open? He answered and said, a man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and I received sight. Then said they unto him, where is he? He said, I know not. They brought to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Oh, there's the great sin and in their eyes is that Jesus would do such a thing on the Sabbath day. And again, then again, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said unto them, he put clay upon mine eyes and I washed and do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. I can guarantee you Nicodemus was probably one of those. Saying, How can a man that is do, do such miracles unless he's being of God? Um, they say unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him? And that he hath opened thine eyes. He said, He's a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. See how hard-headed these people are? Somebody has said something, and I know it's, I probably will tear it up and not quote it properly. He is not so blind as he who will not see. That's these people. They refuse to see. Jesus has been reasoning with them for now three and a half years and they refuse they will not they will not they will not and uh the prophets both isaiah jeremiah and even ezekiel were told you're going to go to a stiff-necked hard-hearted people who seeing will not see and hearing they will not hear and there jesus is going through the same thing they then they asked them saying is this your son who you say was born blind how then doth he now see his parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him. He shall speak for himself. See, these people were so intimidating, intimidating that they had these people trying to be careful how they answered them. They're trying to not, you know, offend them. They could be kicked out of the temple. They had the authority to kick people out of the temple forever. You can never come back here. And that was very serious. 
Verse 22, these words spake his parents because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore said his parents, he is of age, ask him. Then called they again the man that was blind. And get it, they've already questioned him once. And uh, they called him again and said to him, give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, whether he be a sinner or no, I know what not. One thing I know that whereas I was blind, now I see. They said unto him again, what did he, what did he to thee? How open he thine eyes? He answered, I have told you already, and ye did not hear. Wherefore would ye hear it again? Will you also be his disciples? <laughs> this man was being pretty sarcastic with them. And uh, <laughs> we know that God spake unto Moses, as for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. The man answered and said to them, Why, here is a marvelous thing. This is this common sense speaking right here. Here it is a marvelous thing. And I lost my place. Verse 20, 30. That ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, it was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. I mean, somebody's teaching somebody a lesson here. <laughs> Think about it. They answered, said, that thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? See their presupposition? The same question the disciples asked in the first verse. Thou wast altogether born in sins. Well, weren't they also? See, they're so messed up in their own understanding of their condition. All of us were born into sin, folks. These men were high and mighty, self-righteous, and yet they were so far away from God. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Admit that you're a sinner. That's the key. It says, and they cast him out. You dare to teach us, you're out of here. So they cast him out. Jesus heard that they did cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Isn't that great? Here is a, a man that was, had just received his sight, but now he confesses Christ as his Lord. And it's, I think it's also interesting that the Lord found him the first time, and the Lord finds him again because he knows all things. He knew he was going to be kicked out. He knew he was going to be treated this way by the Jews. He goes and finds him. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see might not see, and that they which see might be made blind. And that's kind of what's, what's happening here. Um, think about it in today's age. We were just talking back there in the vestibule about that sheet of paper and the wicked books that are being promoted by the Kent District Library. By the way, if you get a chance, if you're, uh, if you are a um, Algoma Township resident, please vote on May second. Vote yes that we could pull out of that. Uh, they're promoting this drag queen garbage. That's the books they want to promote, and it's it is filthy garbage. Um, but this just the whole thing that people in this world think they're intelligent think they're enlightened, if you will, because they're inclusive. They're inclusive to include these things that involve hurting little children, forcing them to go through unspeakable surgeries, unspeakable changes in their bodies. They're not old enough to make that decision. They circumvent the parents. A lot of people that are pushing this don't consult the parents. Some of these children have been had these things done to them without the parents until they find out and it's too late. Folks, these people are blinded by Satan. They're blinded to the truth. And it is it goes much deeper. It's a very much a part of the, the problem of the heart. But it says God's purpose is to, I, I think it's kind of like that verse in Revelation. Now he that is holy, let him be holy still. Uh, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. 
there's, there's coming a point where it's going to be too late. God has been uh, long-suffering. He has been waiting patiently for people to come to the knowledge of the truth. But there is going to be a closing of the window of opportunity, a cutoff. And that's when it's going to be too late. And these people are going to be set like concrete in their position where he says that they which see might not see and that they which see might be made blind. And so here he's talking to a formerly blind man of what he's up to as God. He's causing these so-called enlightened spiritual leaders to be blind because they won't accept him. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said to them, are we blind also? Then Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. He's just saying it's, it's in, a, in their cognitive understanding of their own sin. When they say, We can see, or we, uh, we're not born out of sin like this man was, they're not saved because they're not willing to humble themselves and admit that they all were born into sin. So they're blind. I'm almost done here. Um, Therefore, your sin remaineth. I'm thankful that my sin doesn't remain because mm -hmm. it was covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Isn't that great? I, I love this verse in Revelation. It's just a wonderful verse. Revelation 1, 5. It says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Isn't that great? He's washed us from our sins in our own blood. So our sin doesn't remain. But anyone who thinks, oh, I'm okay. I've got it. I've got a wonderful pedigree. Uh, I'm a good person. That should count for something. I am, I am a better Christian than, I'm a better person than, you can fill in the blanks. No, it doesn't mean anything to God. If you want your sin to remain, then just ignore God's plea, God's spirit saying come. But if you want your sin to be covered by the blood of Christ, you need to come to him and you need to ask him to be your savior. Father, thank you for this uh, wonderful chapter about the man born blind. We're thankful what you did to him in healing him. But Lord, we see the blindness of these people who would not accept that you could do that. Help us, Lord. We're going to go come across blind people all the time in our lives. We, we ask that you would give us wisdom in dealing with them. Bless now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm just going to go over here and shut this off for a second.